Okay, good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending on where you are, and welcome to this uh, webinar. My name is Nick Boucher. I'm a visiting fellow at the German Marshall Fund, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this event. This event is part of the project called Fourth Live Neo Authoritarianisms in Europe and the Liberal Democratic Response. And this is a project funded by the European Union and led by the Central European University. And GMF is very pleased to be one of the partners in the consortium. Um, just to reiterate, we have today two very good speakers who will be introducing the project. First is uh, Jolt Eniedi. I hope I did not mess up the pronunciation of the name too much. Uh, Jolt is a professor at the Central European University and also a senior researcher at the CEU Democracy Institute and a very well-known author on many of his issues over the years. And I'm also happy that we have my colleague, Jean Avec, from who is also a visiting fellow at GMF and who is our lead person on the Authlib project. So what we will do today is we will first have Jolt briefly presenting the project, because I do believe this is the first uh, public facing webinar on this project, which has not been running for so long. And following that, he will also then give a brief uh, presentation of, shall we say, the intellectual ground on which uh, the project rests. Um, following this, uh, Juliana will then come in and add a certain layer to this, particularly in terms of the international dimensions of this element in Europe. And following that, we will go to questions and answers. So please don't feel free to start sending your questions either in the Q&A function or in the chat function. Uh, do not wait, of course, you don't have to wait until we get to that point. We will just, we're just as happy to get a buildup of questions that I can pick from when the time comes. So after Jolt and Trujana have made their presentations, I will ask a first round of questions, they will respond, and then I will open it as quickly and as extensively as possible to the questions from the audience. So on that note, I will hand over to you, Jolt, now to do your dual presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Let me start by uh, thanking GMF for giving us the opportunity to present our uh, project and to speak about our first uh, thoughts and findings uh, on this topic. I will share my screen and um, I will show a very short, um, sorry, um, PowerPoint presentation about the project itself that was launched in October, that is uh, six months from now. I hope you see uh, my screen. So, uh, Basically, this is a Horizon project, uh, as you mentioned, it's also financed to some extent by the Brit British uh, uh, Research uh, uh, Council. We have eight members, the ones you see on the screen, and uh, we are uh, working on this project in the coming three years. It will uh, take uh, three years to come up with our final report, but uh, <clears throat> we can already start uh, talking about the, some of the issues we we are facing. The fundamental objective of the project is to um, think uh, and measure uh, uh, the various kinds of illiberalisms that exist today, thereby also to update and make more precise the ideological uh, space uh, map, that is the way uh, how we see the changes in the landscape of European ideologies, and at the same time to rethink what could be the liberal democratic response to these challenges. Now, uh, next to describing these configurations, ideological, ideational configurations, we also want to explain them, and we will do so by uh, referring to social factors, psychological uh, triggers. We will also devote attention to uh, emotions, there will be uh, uh, quite a lot of research um, directed to uh, trajectories, historical uh, uh, background. We will analyze organizational strategies. And finally, we will come up with a couple of recommendations. 
the scope, the geographic scope of the um, uh, project is mainly Europe, within that European Union, and within European Union, the uh, seven countries that are our target countries, the ones that you see on uh, this uh, screen. In order to have a, a very rough uh, a picture about the structure of the uh, project, please uh, have a look at this somewhat complicated uh, graph. It tries to uh, describe the various work packages within uh, the project. As you can see, we will uh, uh, devote uh, quite some energy in the coming months to measure uh, primarily through the analysis of political text ideological configurations. Then we will go to the analysis of mass attitudes uh, and elite attitudes. Uh, we will try to uh, obtain new measurements on the ideological profile of political parties. We will study uh, rhetorical and emotional appeals. There will be a work package <clears throat> that will focus on policies, on uh, the style of governance of uh, illiberal forces. We will um, check the way how illiberal uh, actors communicate with each other and how illiberal ideas uh, diffuse across the European uh, political space. But we will also consider whether uh, Russian actors and American actors and some other external actors have an influence on European uh, political thought. We will have, as I mentioned, a team of historians working on uh, the trajectories of illiberal projects. Then we will try to integrate uh, the information gained from these various uh, types of information into one multidimensional map. We also have a group of political philosophers who will help us figuring out what sort of interventions are morally permissible against the illiberal challenge. And finally, we will have a set of mini publics where ordinary people, educators, uh, 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 journalists, and other actors will be brought together belonging to different ideological persuasions to see how they interact with each other, how they react to our own findings, and to what extent the deliberative process that takes place among them can change uh, the opinions on these matters. Here comes a very short uh, description of the type of information we use. We will use a lot of uh, text, as I mentioned. We will uh, uh, have a new expert study. We will do laboratory experiments, uh, particularly in order to uh, uh, measure uh, the role of emotional uh, appeals. We will conduct interviews. And then, as I mentioned, we will have a, a couple of questionnaires trying to measure the attitudes of uh, citizens. And we will also employ some uh, survey experiments in order to see to what extent the opinion of citizens uh, may change uh, considering various arguments. So this is, in a nutshell, uh, the project. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, we are at the beginning of the road. so. There will be many surprises and setbacks, but I hope we will be able to uh, come up with a sound report in three years from now. Great, thank you very much, uh, Zuzan. I don't know if you want to add anything briefly on that level regarding uh, our side of the participation in the project, I mean, just to give Zuzan a small break before I launch him into his next job. Uh, yes, happy to. Um... I would also like to welcome everybody who joined us this afternoon or this morning. Um, to introduce you our role, uh, GMF is um, the communication and dissemination partner of the Outlib project. So uh, we will be responsible for um, not only supporting the research, but also uh, translating the academic work of our colleagues um, into policy relevant findings um, and reaching out to the policy community uh, in the course of these three years. Um, I'm very optimistic that by the end of these three years, with the help of our colleagues, uh, we will not only uh, 
explore the varieties of illiberalisms, but actually uh, come up with some actionable items, actionable plans to um, support uh, the revitalization of democracy in the European Union and across our target countries, um, not only in the backsliding Central and Eastern European ones, but also um, by addressing democratic challenges in Western Europe. Um, I would also like to encourage you to visit our uh, website, which is www.outlib.eu. I will also put it in the chat for you uh, and to follow us uh, on our social media platforms on Twitter uh, and Facebook and also on our YouTube channel. Uh, with that, I would pass the floor back to Nick and Joel, and I will be very much looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Susanna. Okay, Joel, so now the floor is back to you in its fullness to explain a bit more about the background to this project and where you are, at least at this point. Actually, I was um, asked by Juji to speak mainly about the first working paper of the uh, project that can be also found on our uh, website. Uh, <clears throat> I should start perhaps by uh, emphasizing that um, the background to this uh, paper is um, the fact uh, recently reported by uh, the Varieties of Democracy uh, project, uh, according to which more than 40% of the global population lives in countries that are undergoing uh, autocratization as we speak. And uh, my paper tried to explore the ideological layer of uh, this democratic backsliding. Now, um, there are many studies on this topic, but they tend to neglect ideology, uh, focusing more on, um, in, on the interest of the autocratic leaders, their calculations, or on macrostructural factors like um, the growing um, inequalities or the changing in the geopolitical configurations. And um, there is, in general, skepticism in the academic community about um, ideological explanations, partly because it's difficult to measure them, and uh, but partly because ideological discourse often hides uh, materialistic uh, motivations. And um, indeed, there are many cases, uh, <clears throat> if you look at the autocratizing countries today, where you do not find a very thick uh, ideological layer. So you, you often find the kind of um, um, regression of quality of democracy without a kind of robust challenge to the uh, liberal democratic uh, template. Bulgaria would be probably one of the countries uh, that come to mind. Uh, now, this skepticism against ideology is also backed by the fact that uh, today uh, we live in an era that is very different, let's say, from the interwar era. Uh, at that time, liberal democracy, liberalism, was considered to be dead in big parts of the world. And, um, many very distinct alternatives were uh, proposed uh, from Bolshevism, communism to fascism and many alternatives in between corporatist ones, traditionalist ones and so on. Today, virtually everybody pays lip service to democracy. Um, so it, there is no uh, similar robust uh, integrated ideological alternative, but that doesn't mean that there are no emerging uh, uh, illiberal ideologies around. Um, when you look at the autocratic uh, projects and what uh, we try to find something that is in common uh, in them, what you see is that typically they explicitly or implicitly argue that liberal democracy is not able to achieve social and cultural integration. It's very difficult to apply the left-right terminology uh, to them. Uh, but to the extent one can do so, one could conclude that uh, when it comes to uh, cultural values, they tend to be more right-wing, and it, when it comes to economic values, they tend to be more left-wing, but the cultural frames are the more prominent ones. 
So one thing that I try to do in the paper is to think about different kinds of illiberalisms. And there are many ways to slice the cake. One is actually the traditional left-right uh, dimension. And then one can speak about, let's say, more classically right-wing um, autocratizers. Uh, right-wing also in the sense that they are typically supported by um, wealthier uh, groups in the society, more educated people. Um, you can think of um, Fujimori in Peru or Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, to some extent Duterte in Philippines. They are typically, uh, uh, ba they, they base their, their, their campaign on the fear of these people from the chaos that is associated with the left. Sometimes they also use, by the way, anti-communism that is not completely dead, but when they speak about anti-communism, they understand it in a more cultural uh, way. Now, if you go to the other end of the spectrum, you find people like Morales, Chavez, Maduro, Correa. They, of course, have a very different argumentation. They basically fight against um, uh, economic oligarchy. Um, they struggle for the emancipation of marginalized groups, uh, stand for egalitarianism, anti-Americanism, and so on. But they also implement uh, authoritarian measures. The, the case that is maybe most important nowadays, India, also shows how difficult it is to apply the left-right label, because although BJP and Modi, they have a very clear right-wing cultural uh, uh, profile, uh, kind of Hindu nationalistic uh, cultural profile, it's very difficult to place uh, them on the economic uh, left-right. Um, and the further complication comes from, from the fact that these forces often uh, borrow even from the liberal discourse. Uh, so you often see nowadays that they use uh, freedom of speech arguments, particularly when they complain about a censorship in media, especially international media, about political correctness. Um, and they uh, embrace the values of pluralism and, and uh, tolerance, but in a very, very specific sense. So they, they uh, use these terms when they object to the progressive regulations of private and public affairs, and when they advocate a multipolar world in which different kinds of regimes can exist next to each other. Um, what seems to be in common in them uh, is their opposition to universalism. And indeed, if you think about it, universalism is a very provocative ideological orientation. It sits uneasily with national sovereignty, localism, religion-based uh, uh, political identities. And it's also, historically speaking, um, it's a Western phenomenon. It's, at least it is seen as a Western idea, it has a Western flavor, and this is uh, something that is used, uh, uh, that autocratizers can use, especially in other uh, uh, regions of the world. And, and the region where already in the 1990s this was raised as a major issue was Asia, where this Asian values rhetoric was very strong at that time, but, but I think it still matters. It's a, it's a kind of ideology that places society and family above the individual and uh, thinks in terms of social harmony, uh, uh, collective safety, as opposed to individual freedom or, or uh, competition. Um, they also want a very uh, active, especially economically, but also culturally active uh, state, a non-neutral state. Um, they want the state to lead the society. This is a, a way of thinking that also characterizes uh, Putin uh, to some extent. Uh, and, and it's a way of thinking that basically give, uh, gives sovereignty not to the people, but to the state, or in some cases, uh, the nation. Um, one interesting point that I, I drew attention to in this paper that these forces that I'm talking about in their own region are uh, uh, rivaled um, by some more fundamentalist uh, actors, actors who do not worship social harmony. Uh, so these are, these are the, the, the forces that uh, are even more against the West. But ironically, they are quite similar to Western forces in the sense that they want more bottom-up participation, more contestation, and they are more uh, ready to polarize the political uh, uh, sphere. 
Another uh, uh, value or orientation that I look at is anti-globalization. And it is something that is um, more present or more visibly present in advanced capitalist societies that suffered uh, uh, out of the side effect of, of, of globalization. And uh, it was particularly spectacular to see how the kind of nationalist and populist reaction in the United States led to isolationism, led to um, uh, Trump and, and other uh, phenomena. But the, you can see this mentality in many parts uh, of the world. To some extent, uh, uh, Netanyahu is also a case in point in, in the sense that he also supports this uh, first thing, things first type of rhetoric that is um, something that is sometimes called a realist uh, a rhetoric, where, where basically leaders say that our job as elected leaders is to represent our nation, within our nation, the majority of the nation. We have to take care of law and order, survival, sustainability, demographic sustainability, particularly, and cultural legacies. And we can't work with the concept that are abstract, like human rights and freedom of movement and so on, because they just interfere with our fundamental uh, um, task. Um, what I also emphasize in this paper is that much of the autocratic ideology today can be and should be interpreted in the culture war framework. And we should remind ourselves that in the last decades, we have seen some extremely spectacular victories on the liberal side. So uh, liberal values in culture um, had um, basically half a century of continuous victories. And to some extent, uh, autocratic reaction is a backlash uh, to this. And, and um, it's very often the case today that um, the fear of replacement uh, by uh, foreigners, by local minorities, Roma in Eastern Europe or Muslims in India, is sort of um, uh, put together with the fear uh, of replacement by sexual minorities or, or minorities that uh, have become recently emancipated. And the idea is that we need to do something proactive in order to uh, uh, safeguard our old way of life. and. And uh, therefore, um, there is more and more uh, effort at uh, changing school curriculum, making sure that uh, <clears throat> NGOs are kept out of the school, uh, sex education is uh, either completely eliminated or in the hands of more traditionalist um, uh, actors. In general, the, the value of traditionalism is key to many of the autocratizers. And it's, it's kind of based on, on, a, on a form of conservatism, but it's a illiberal form of conservatism. One that thinks that democracy is fine, but it's contaminated by too much internationalism, human rights, multiculturalism. So we have to remove all these things. Uh, so it's not any kind of conservatism, but an illiberal uh, kind of conservatism. And this attitude is combined in Europe with what I call a civilizationist ethnocentrism, by which I mean that the idea is that the world is composed of um, relatively small ethnocultural units. They are the real agents, but at the same time, they should flock together into larger camps uh, and preserve together the cultural legacy of that larger unit in case of um, uh, illiberal actors in Europe, this is white and Christian uh, legacy that uh, supposed to be preserved. I also have a, a quick look at, at religion, but uh, religion doesn't play a big role in many of our cases. It, it, it is important in some, and in general, there is this rhetoric of complaining about the extreme secularization or sec secularism of liberal uh, democracy and about mor moral uh, relativism and, and so on. Um, but the um, alliance between religious institutions and illiberals is often um, torpedoed or sabotaged by um, the clergy 
which in many parts of the world is pro-democratic and is not happy about this alliance. There are some instances where the clergy is very active. There are uh, evangelical groups in Latin America, particularly and in Africa that are in the uh, front line of uh, illiberalism. And of course, uh, when we speak about uh, anti-gender discourse, which is a very important module of illiberalism today, you should remember that it was in a way launched by the Vatican originally, although it has spread uh, quite far. Now, uh, many scholars use the term populism to describe the phenomenon I'm talking about. And in the paper, I argue that this is not a very good term in the sense that um, um, autocratization, uh, illiberalism in general is not uh, identical with populism. And this is partly so because um, many of the illiberal efforts are elitist. And uh, actually some of the uh, ones that I mentioned uh, uh, can be considered to be elitist. And to the extent that populism is a driving force, I think this is more the type that I call a paternalist populism. And by paternalist populism, I mean a specific type of populism, the one that does refer uh, to the homogeneous people, does refer to the corrupt elite, particularly international elites. But at the same time, it venerates the state, thinks that uh, the state and the elite of the state has a role of educating and leading the people. And they don't have a, a amorphous idea of the people like most idea typical populists, but quite precise one, they think in terms of modern citizens. And they think that the government should subsidize these uh, modern citizens and not anybody. And, and they think of the state as a force that is capable of um, combating the um, arbitrariness of both markets and international uh, uh, um, configurations uh, that the state is able to resist inter imperialistic interventions and that um, the financial global financial institutions and great powers can be beaten if we um, give enough power to our own leader. So the, 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 the people uh, are supposed to be bound by some kind of uh, common ideology, but the leader is supposed to be relatively free to choose his or her uh, political strategy because you have to be victorious in this international struggle. And, and, and um, so this, this is basically this is a hierarchical idea as opposed to uh, idea typical uh, populism. Um, of course, it can vary across countries whether more the populist side is emphasized or more the paternalist side. And interestingly, if you think of countries such as Italy, radical right in Italy, you see two parties, one emphasizing more the populist side, this is the league, and the other one, the brothers of Italy, emphasizing more the paternalist side because of its uh, uh, fascist uh, uh, roots. But what is common in paternalist populism is this, um, belief that um, uh, the people are not perfect, the people can be improved. And one way to improve them is through uh, education. And this is why there is interest, more and more interest in uh, history books, in, in uh, schools. So to change the, the uh, cu curricula in schools, this is something that is done in Poland, in Hungary, in Brazil, and, and now it's done also in the United States, uh, in spite of the fact that they, their, their legacy is very different. So just to conclude, there is a lot of diversity in, in uh, illiberalism across the world. Uh, there is no one united robust alternative to liberal democracy. There are some common elements though, um, the, uh, these autocratizers like to speak about the decline of the West, like to uh, say that um, somehow the linkage between the real people and the government was broken by the radicalized liberal social elites. And now the, the, this new uh, uh, autocratizer can reestablish the linkage in one way or another. 
um, they tend to be uh, typically very strongly for national uh, sovereignty. Uh, often that comes with uh, appropriating anti-colonial discourse, which is uh, helps them to rally uh, people around the flag against international world order. And in general, they like to speak about uh, these shadowy uh, figures. Uh, George Soros is, is obviously a common enemy for both left-wing and right-wing liberals. Um, and about uh, foreign-hearted uh, uh, local elites that um, pose such a big danger to the nation that um, we must uh, authorize our leaders to act and to act swiftly because this is the only way to uh, rescue our democracy. So I, I think I, I should conclude with that. I used up my time. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. That was certainly an, a lot to digest already to start up with. Um, just to remind the audience, you can already put questions in the Q&A or chat function. We already have a question coming in. Uh, so please don't hesitate to start sending them in. Um, until we get to the question, I'll just pass over now to you, Shujana. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Nick. Um, not debating what uh, Joet was laying out, uh, I would rather build on this and uh, take our discussion um, further by after this global overview, zooming in a little bit on Europe and particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, um, I would like to also link with my contribution to some of our upcoming agenda items within the project. We will have uh, work packages on illiberalism in power uh, and also on the transnational cooperation of uh, these illiberal actors. So uh, in my contribution, I would uh, take Central Europe and particularly Fides and PIS as um, such illiberal actors uh, as a starting point. I believe these two parties uh, display uh, these three cornerstone of uh, ideological modules that uh, Joet has identified across the board. So um, illiberal um, conservatism, civilizationist ethnocentrism, and paternalist populism, I believe, are all at display when we look at the ideologies of these parties. Um, in fact, I would argue that uh, these are not just uh, elements of uh, authoritarianism in this case, or liberalism, but to contribute to the uh, cacophony of uh, conceptual terms. Uh, I would also argue that uh, in these cases, these two parties are actually radical right parties or have transformed into radical right parties over time through um, a co-optation of uh, the ideological uh, modules of um, their prior allies, or in some cases, in case of Fidesz, definitely competitors uh, from the radical right uh, and of the party spectrum. In the case of uh, Fidesz, this has been a process starting from the early 2000s, um, co-opting elements from the uh, ideology of the Hungarian law and um, and the Justice Party in the case of PIS from the mid 2000s on by adopting ideological elements from the League of Polish Families uh, and through that arriving to um, what we see today as a fairly robust, I would argue, radical right ideology um, that encompasses uh, all these illiberal conservatist, civilizationist, ethnocentric uh, elements. Um, Joet mentions that um, the ideology of these actors um, is very much rooted in uh, the idea of uh, realism of the defense of the majority population. And I would argue that this majority population um, is 
generally linking to the idea of uh, civilization as ethnocentrism is defined in most cases in ethnocultural terms, uh, leading to the ideology being fundamentally uh, exclusionary uh, in these cases. And whereas in Central and Eastern Europe, we have um, had the situation where the excluded minority has been mostly defined in um, ethnic terms, uh, rarely uh, religious terms. From 2015 on, we see a shift uh, in these parties, especially um, redefining uh, what constitutes this ethnocultural uh, threat to the majority population. And uh, through that, adopting ideological elements that were previously characteristic of uh, such illiberal actors uh, in Western Europe. Uh, what am I referring to? Um, 2015 refugee and migration crisis, of course, um, and with that, the new element of the migrant, the Muslim, uh, as a rising threat uh, appearing in the vocabulary and the rhetoric of uh, such illiberal actor actors in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and through that, uh, bringing these together uh, or, or um, closer together um, ideologically with their Western European counterparts. So uh, through this, uh, waves of ideological shifts in uh, autocratizing or authoritarian rather powers emerging in the region. Um, I think we have seen increasing opportunity for them to uh, engage uh, internationally, um, which they both use and construct, um, in my opinion. Um, I believe that, uh, especially after 2015, um, there is uh, an increasing drive as well for uh, the international cooperation of these actors for which the European Union has actually provided a perfect platform, however much these uh, actors typically criticize um, the EU per se. Um, when we look at uh, specifically uh, at the case of Fidesz, what we have seen, especially after the party's um, departure from the European People's Parties, uh, is um, a very conscious and uh, proactive effort to seek out new potential allies who are ideologically uh, in this broader uh, illiberal radical right uh, group uh, across the continent, whether or not in power. Um, in the case of Fidesz, this sort of alliance building is um, actually blurring the lines between the party and the state level um, using the very position that we see here, a governing party. Um, to give you some concrete examples in this regard, um, there have been repeated instances where government officials, so officials who are supposed to represent the state, have been meeting with radical right parties in opposition uh, abroad, strengthening those ideological party ties. Um, in the end of uh, 21, Foreign Minister Sierto was essentially touring the Nordic and the uh, Western European countries, meeting small radical right parties, or sometimes not that small um, leaders uh, in an attempt to build um, an international alliance. More recently, we have seen an official visit from President uh, Katalin Novak, a former vice president of the Fidesz party, uh, to the Czech Republic meeting um, Babish, who 
at the point was definitely not a counterpart for her. So we see there is a blurring uh, between uh, how such uh, autocratic actors are using um, both state and party channels um, and function in a very uh, opportunistic way. Um, this may also raise the question um, whether the ideology is overall an instrument or an actual belief held by um, these actors. And I will come back uh, to that uh, at a later point. Um, so to conclude this uh, short block, um, my main point here would be that um, essentially adopting uh, these similar ideological modules rooted in uh, ethnocentric beliefs uh, and the approximation of what is defined as the enemy, as a threat to the majority population, again, defined in ethnocultural terms, is an opportunity um, and the facilitating factor for the international alliance building and cooperation of these actors in the European Union uh, with Fidesz and also to some extent PI as being a um, key example. But again, on the example of these two parties, we can also show the limits uh, of this cooperation, which are rooted in the very same thing, uh, in my opinion. Um, so this um, construction, uh, identification of what poses a threat um, is also what can uh, put these actors um, or, or pitch them against uh, each other. Since at the very core, and Joat argues this uh, in his paper, lies the defense of the majority population, if uh, there is a conflict in uh, what constitutes that uh, threat, um, that can pitch these actors against each other. Uh, as long as that threat, that enemy, that um, poses a threat to the majority population is not posing an immediate threat, or uh, is not perceived to pose an immediate threat, it may be swept under the rug as we have seen over the years in the case of uh, specifically Fidesz and uh, PIS. But as soon as this uh, real or perceived or constructed in some cases, threat uh, becomes imminent um, to one party, uh, or the other, and there's a conflict in that, this is what limits uh, their cooperation. Um, ultimately, Russia's aggression um, is um, a good example for uh, highlighting this. We have seen that uh, before Russia's attack on, uh, on Ukraine uh, last year, there has been massive coalition building uh, across Europe among uh, these forces, where Fidesz also tried to play a bridge builder. Uh, but as long as this um, imminent threat is present uh, in the eyes of one of these actors, that cooperation is pretty much uh, put to a halt uh, and cannot really proceed. So uh, with an eye on the upcoming European parliamentary elections, um, we could argue that essentially Russia's attack uh, on Ukraine is something that may seriously influence whether such illiberal um, authoritarian autocratic radical right, just again to emphasize the uh, multiple layers of the phenomenon, um, so Russia's attack on Ukraine uh, is likely to significantly hamper uh, the prospects of their cooperation. Um, I wanted to uh, pick up on one more point. 
that uh, Joet raised uh, in his paper, which I very much liked uh, actually, but want to contest. Uh, Joet, uh, you uh, concluded your paper uh, when you were uh, assessing whether or not there is um, a rise of a new unified ideology um, of, of the autocratizers. Um, and you concluded that there uh, are these three elements that are increase, increasingly common and there is this uh, increasing ideological framing. Uh, but you said that um, autocracies uh, only need to legitimize their own rule. Uh, they don't need to legitimize each other. So this may be something that prevents the rise of uh, a unified ideology. But what I've been uh, pondering is, uh, and again, uh, through the example of uh, Fides, um, that yes, true, they don't need to legitimize each other. Uh, autocracies don't, but autocratic actors uh, may very well uh, use ideology to legitimize themselves, uh, use ideology as a mean of connecting to other actors uh, perceived as legitimate, powerful, um, to lift their own profile, to uh, frame themselves as uh, an actor that uh, is to be taken seriously domestically. So uh, whereas Indeed, maybe there is no need for a universal um, ideology uh, of autocratization or, or authoritarianism that would um, unite them uh, internationally. Um, this is, I think, very much an instrument that they do use to uh, legitimize their own domestic rule. And here I think um, the issue of the ideology that they hold is really a belief or is just an instrument hiding certain material interests that you mentioned in your uh, introduction, why um, certain uh, scholars would not study ideology as such. Um, is, is relevant and, and um, I think it's, it's also a discussion that I very often uh, run into, um, typically also in the case of uh, Fides, uh, whether or not it really is this or that uh, party. So I just wanted to um, add this at the end because I, I found that um, conclusion really interesting. Uh, and maybe what I said is actually not really contesting what you said, but just added a, an additional layer to that. I would stop here. I think I talked way too much, uh, but we have uh, quite some time for the discussion. Back to you, Nick. Thank you very much, Susanna. Okay, well, I think we have plenty to chew on, including a challenge or half challenge from Susanna Tujolt on one of the aspects of on one conclusion of his paper. Uh, Jean, I'll come back to you. I'm going to mix maybe two questions that we have in the chat already from the audience. One that you slightly already made a mention, a reply in the chat in terms of the question of paternal, paternalistic rather, populism and the undermining of liberal values in the name of the greater, greater good. Um, and whether you see this as a co-optation, this co-optation of populism as both an equally left-right phenomena and as a more universal technique of political author authoritarianism. And I think in connection to this also, or in parallel to this, I think there is a sort of another question from the audience in terms of the, the classic tension in the debate on illiberalism versus uh, authoritarianism and the, the, the very fundamental question of is illiberalism lip service uh, masquerade uh, as a cover for what is effectively authoritarianism. So I think these two, if you could just elaborate these two little points, uh, 
And then after that, if you would like to, of course, respond to Jujana's point also about the question of a unifying ideology or the uh, uh, an emerging unified ideology of autocratization. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me start with the, the most difficult one, um, this um, difference and overlap between uh, authoritarianism and illiberalism. And I say it's the most difficult one because uh, yesterday just uh, we had uh, in the Outlib uh, project a four hour uh, debate on issues like that. Actually, the, the three leading concepts that we are working uh, are populism, authoritarianism, neo authoritarianism, and illiberalism. And to separate them and give a distinct meaning to them is extremely difficult because the literature uses each of these concepts in millions of ways. And, and so it's difficult to do uh, uh, justice. Now, uh, when it comes specifically to the um, relationship between authoritarianism and illiberalism and whether the lip service paid by um, <clears throat> current day autocratizers should be taken seriously. I would say that yes, in the sense that if you look at the mode of, of autocratization, it is a specific mode. It, it doesn't come with military coups. It doesn't come with um, introduction of martial law and, and uh, um, kind of open dictatorial measures. It happens um, typically by constitutional engineering and much of it is actually informal, not formal. So the existing uh, institutions of democracy or if you like liberal democracy are kept intact, at least on paper. Uh, you still have constitutional courts, you still have ombudsman, you have uh, some sort of media uh, pluralism in most of the cases. But it is just uh, filled in with a completely different content. And it's done in very nuanced way uh, through various informal techniques, uh, through appointing specific individuals to specific uh, position, blackmailing other actors and so on. So uh, this mode of operation is very much an outcome of the lip service to democracy. You cannot go, uh, you cannot have a frontal attack on, on democracy, you have to do it otherwise. And, and of course that constrains what you can say, constrains what you can do, constrains what uh, sort of relations can exist in a society between institutions and civil society and, government and so on. So it is consequential. Of course, at the end of the day, you see executive ag aggrandizement, you see uh, undermining of rule of law, you see uh, either uh, open or, or uh, kind of uh, um, hidden uh, type of uh, censorship introduced. But they have an answer to this. They, they say that this is something that you see in liberal democracy as well. There you also see that the state doesn't behave in a neutral way. There are certain values that are promoted uh, by the government. Uh, there are certain views that are banned or uh, ostracized or uh, uh, at least uh, uh, symbolically uh, sanctioned. Um, why are we not allowed to have our way of life uh, uh, prevailing in our country? So th this kind of rhetoric, I think, has a huge resonance today, and um, and some of the excesses of the progressives often play into the hands of these illiberal conservatives who jump on on it and say that well, if you can uh, impose your way of life or your values in uh, the societies that you rule, then why can't we do the same in the societies where we are at home, so to say? So I, I think it's consequential, but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, you know it has to be taken uh, uh, literally uh, what they say. Um, now I, I recall uh, Jujie's question, uh, which was about uh, that uh, this um, while they don't have uh, obligation to legitimize other autocracies, still. Uh, by um, criticizing liberal democracy and by 
uh, promoting um, certain um, ways of doing politics that is common in other autocratizing countries, they still develop some sort of ideological discourse that is usable then domestically. They can, well, ideology has this function basically of uh, legitimizing uh, the, their rule. And if they can say that uh, people like us are uh, fighting uh, for uh, uh, their right across the world, we are not alone. And, and actually, if you look around and uh, you know the VDEM data can be used to say that actually the world is going in, in an illiberal direction. So uh, we are not um, some isolated um, uh, backwater actor who uh, doesn't understand the, the 21st century's uh, logic. We are actually in the front line. We are the ones who understand the new era and um, are able to get rid of those taboos that um, uh, make some of the old uh, Western democracies so ossified, so unable to uh, compete uh, on the world market. Look at, at Asian tigers, how much better they are. So yes, this, this is something that is used very much domestically. There was one more uh, question, but now I don't remember. Uh, just slightly on uh, the pat paternalistic uh, populism and uh, just to elaborate a little bit on the comment you put in the Q&A. Uh, yes, I, I, I try to answer it uh, in the meantime. Um, so um, just let me see what was my... No, I don't see it. The, the point is that uh, indeed, this is a logic that is compatible both with uh, left-wing and right-wing ideologies and is, uh, is used by both. To some extent, of course, you could argue that historically speaking, populism is more a left-wing ideology because it's about uh, the people as opposed to this uh, hierarchical uh, uh, feudal or, or uh, traditional uh, rule against oligarchies, against elites. It used to be, in that sense, a left-wing product, but it was appropriated by the right a uh, long time ago, and by now, perhaps it's even used more by the right than by the left. Paternalism is um, something that is more at home on the right, again, classically and historically and, and maybe philosophically as well, but uh, it has its uh, left-wing uh, lineage, uh, uh, you could go back to Enlightenment, you can go back to, uh, I don't know, Leninism, you can go back to various left-wing uh, versions of this um, avant-garde, uh, the, 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 the type of uh, 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 small uh, um, group of people who possess uh, the knowledge of the right way forward, who have the obligation to share this knowledge, but they also have then the privileged position to some extent impose this knowledge on others. So th this can be found uh, on the left as well. And this particular combination is also uh, compatible with both, I think. And in that sense, it's universal. Great, thank you very much. Um, I have another question, which is from uh, Mike Smelser on Freedom House. And it's about the durability or the resilience of these modules of ideological of ideolo ideological modules of autocratization um, especially when you find yourself in the in the moment where we are with the situation regarding Russia so if, do what does this tell us today about the resilience of these models and the particular question that uh, Mike puts is basically do we think that countries like Poland and Hungary which are the lead cases that we talk about in in the EU, do they have the same weakness uh, that we can uh, survive in terms of the authoritarian, authoritarian states of Eurasia? Uh, well, as the Chinese uh, used to say, it's too early to tell in the sense that um, even when you think about Russia, I'm not so sure we have clear, overwhelming evidence indicating the vulnerability or the weakness of the Putinist ideology. Um, I would even argue that uh, years ago, 
if we heard that a um, country like Russia can lose hundred, more than 100,000 people in a war that uh, is not likely to be won and uh, being faced with various sanctions, well, there will be uh, social resistance against uh, the government who embarked on such a futile mission. And uh, the same, uh, if you think about Hungary now, inflation is uh, incredibly high. Uh, economically, the government um, faces challenges that never before. And yet its popularity is as high as ever. And, and as far as I know, most Russians uh, support the government, most Russians support the war, obviously. You cannot know for sure because it's, it's a dictatorship, so very dangerous to uh, uh, um, express uh, uh, opinions to the contrary. But still, uh, there are no clear, obvious signs of uh, uh, the cohesion uh, falling apart behind Putin. And one, un one answer to this puzzle is ideology. Of course, the other one is propaganda, which is kind of overlapping. Uh, but uh, the point is that there is a narrative, there is a worldview that uh, makes sense to many Russians. It makes sense um, uh, across the world to some extent. And it's not accidental that Putin started to speak uh, recently about um, some Western churches uh, allowing same-sex marriage. Why does he do that? I mean, why would that matter for a Russian citizen right now in this uh, 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 terrible uh, war situation? But the point is that um, he can make the claim the world went mad, the world was captured by an irresponsible and um, somewhat unhealthy uh, small uh, minority. We are the same uh, uh, traditionalist uh, uh, people who try to do things uh, in line with uh, the fundamental value commitments of our culture and ourselves, like individuals who live today around. And we don't want this madness. We don't want this madness partly because it's not compatible with our values, but also because it clearly will end badly. The West will, will suffer at the end of the story. And, and, and given that uh, they can point to the rise of China and rise of some other uh, 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 states around the world uh, who are clearly non-liberal uh, democratic and are doing economically better and better. This is what the VDEM report also shows that by now almost half of the GDP is produced by autocracies. That glues together very well into an ideological discourse that allows leaders like Orban and Putin to sell government policies that are at the moment not working in terms of the actual standard of living of the people, but they are working as an explanation of the world. Thank you, Zuzana. Uh, do you want to jump in on the back of this on this particular point? Um, yes, unfortunately, though, I fully agree with uh, Joet uh, on this point. Uh, so maybe just to add, uh, I think um, there is uh, a very important and significant uh, difference in the case of uh, Poland and Hungary when compared to Russia, and namely that is the country's EU membership. And uh, I think this is... Uh, a constraining factor uh, for, for the regimes. Um, there is a significant part of the population that uh, is still very pro-European and with that is also um, committed to a certain set of values, which I think um, is very important to root at least part of the population back in uh, in support for liberal democracy. However, we know that um, the approach of uh, these actors to uh, governance uh, is a very majoritarian one and they tend to shape 
the uh, institutional uh, environment they function in whenever they have the chance uh, to um, their liking, which can counterbalance um, a, a committed, uh, democratically committed part of uh, the population's wish for uh, liberal democracy. Um, having said that, another factor I think we need to keep in mind um, is that this propaganda that Joach was mentioning, uh, ideologized propaganda, um, sadly also has its impact on, uh, on the population. And uh, just to give you an example, the recent Eurobarometer um, poll was already showing that compared to uh, earlier results, uh, support for the European Union uh, is uh, decreasing in Hungary as well amidst of uh, the um, Hungarian government's rhetoric. We also see that uh, this um, propaganda is influential in people's views on who they regard as an ally and as an enemy. Over the years, the pro-Russian narrative of uh, Fidesz has clearly shifted the Hungarian society's um, preferences towards uh, who they uh, see as an ally. Um, and there is uh, more skepticism towards the United States, whereas um, there is a growing uh, embracement of um, building stronger ties with Russia. So there is an impact, a measurable impact, um, unfortunately, uh, on the societal level as well. Um, so maybe just uh, these two points to, to add. Thank you, Jana. Um, I have a, I have a question. So finally, I get to not abuse the position of the moderator, but to at least use it in extremis, perhaps. Uh, Jolt, if I can go back to like, I, I really like the distribution of the conceptualization of these three ideological modules uh, that you work on. So illiberal conservatism, pattern, paternalistic uh, populism, and civilizationist ethnocentrism. Although you've already in these three in these three modules merge about seven concepts, uh, so I think it's a very interesting synthesizing pyramid to try and bring build up to the ideal and uh, a potential ideology of autocratization. I just wonder. I mean, I'm fairly I'm fairly certain, unless I misunderstand you, that you do not argue that these exist in one case in one module, one module, one case, that they probably exist in different combinations in different settings. Um, so my question is, and it's particularly in the European setting, I mean, and maybe this is unfair, maybe this is a sort of looking forward question, but I, I will at least invite you to speculate on this because you are very well informed already to speculate on this. But what would you think or would you say would be the combination, the dosage of these three modules in a particular country that would be the most potent or the most the most impactful and more likely to have long lasting effects and be very much harder to reverse. Um, I would love I would love to get your idea of how you think this could play out because and if you can even draw examples or from Hungary or Poland, which are cases that are most well known, but also possibly some other European countries. You know what combination? What's what's the recipe of these three things that the, that we need to be more worried about if we do manage to identify it in a particular case? Right, it's a, a difficult one. Um, I think political cultures, differences between political cultures, matter here a lot. So, um, like, United States has always had some potential for populism because of the way it was originally constructed and, and how uh, the state uh, is run and, and how uh, civil society plays a, a huge role. While in Europe, traditionally, like going back to the 18th uh, century or so, uh, you ha have a much stronger elitist uh, uh, um, pedigree, a, a kind of elitist way of uh, thinking and to some extent, therefore, the populist uh, aspect is relatively new to Europe. And um, in that sense, uh, it has not 
engulf the European uh, discourse to the to the same extent. Um, whether uh, uh, one or the other has more potential in the future, I think, also depends on external factors such as technology. We know that um, there are some communication technologies that uh, are beneficial, for example, for uh, populism, particularly uh, of the type that uses conspiracy theories and uh, um, polarization as, as a very important uh, mechanism. Another external factor that needs to be taken into account uh, is the likelihood of um, conflicts um, induced by migration. And obviously, whether we will have this kind of conflicts uh, is, depends partly on politics, but it depends partly on climate and, and economy and, and, and factors that we have very little control of. So um, you can easily have uh, um, civilizationism as being the more central in the future, if indeed the case will be that we will see clashes on the, let's say, southern border of the EU uh, uh, between um, asylum seekers, immigrants, and uh, the native uh, population. Here uh, comes an interesting uh, point that um, takes us a bit of, away from this global perspective, but, but perhaps it has something to do with it. Uh, Hungarian uh, radical right, historically speaking, is uh, in favor of Eastern uh, uh, friendships, like uh, alliance with the East, going East to Japan, saying that Hungarians are uh, coming from Asia. We have a mentality that binds us with people over there and so on. This was partly taken over by uh, Orban recently. But the current day radical right-wing party, at, at least its leader, no longer speaks about Eastern uh, friendships and, and Eastern uh, genetics and, and Eastern alliance. He classifies himself as the representative of, of Nordic civilization. Now, maybe Hungary is not the first country that comes to your mind as a Nordic country, but uh, you know, if if you have a somewhat different perspective and you think about these potential conflicts between the global South and the North, and and especially concerning uh, immigration, well, maybe maybe he's right in the sense that uh, uh, maybe this is the the, the conflict of uh, the coming decades, and and being uh, in the forefront of it, he can maybe. Um, build the capital that no other political uh, leader can. So uh, coming back to your question, it's difficult to predict which one will be more uh, uh, effective. Also difficult to say which one will be more dangerous because again, all of them can be done obviously in a more radical and more moderate way. You can uh, be um, just mildly uh, in favor of uh, regulating, I don't know, the uh, public behavior of sexual minorities, or you can do what uh, Uganda is doing. And, and uh, the, so basically all three of them can be done in more extremist, more, more uh, moderate uh, way. And it very much depends partly on the cultural legacies of different um, political uh, systems and partly on external factors such as technology, climate change and uh, migration. Thank you. Um, Jujana, do you want to maybe add anything to that? No? Okay. Um, so I have, I have a, not a follow-up question, but my next question, but I think it connects a little bit to some of the things you said. I was interested by your mention earlier on and your inclusion of the question of the concept of decline of the West in all of this, because I can very well see in the global perspective of both these modules and more generally autocratization trends, the connections to this. To me also is like, how does this play in Europe? Uh, is to me something is worth uh, also maybe digging a little bit more. Does this have the extent of the resonance of the decline of the West in Western countries? Because I think there's clearly a different dynamic involved there. I mean, to a degree, I know, 
Hungary. I think uh, Orban and Fidesz have played on this, uh, but I'm just curious to know a little bit more about how you see this dynamic playing in feeding uh, these uh, ideological trends in, in European and therefore Western countries, which in that logic would be declining. Well, uh, the idea of the decline uh, of the West is a Western idea. Uh, this is, uh, you know, it was championed already more than 100 years ago in, in one form or another, and uh, it has been always uh, uh, there. But obviously, the material successes of um, especially the post Second World War development uh, put these views uh, a little bit uh, in the shadow, and, and um, it was uh, somewhat difficult to base a political campaign on them. Today, when you see on many uh, dimensions that uh, the decline of the West is a fact, and, and uh, maybe even a, from some perspective, a welcome uh, development in the sense that the uh, world becomes a more equal place and, and uh, the, this inherited hierarchies don't uh, exist anymore between imperial powers and uh, former colonized uh, areas of the world. So the, the, this change is uh, objectively happening. There are uh, uh, negative reactions to this change, obviously within the West saying that we are losing, losing ground. And, and then the question is, why are we losing ground? And one answer is because we start embarked on a strategy in the last couple of decades that um, makes us weaker. What is this strategy? Well, the strategy that instead of work, we think in terms of rights, instead of obligations and duties, we think in terms of rights, we, 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 we uh, uh, start to think in terms of uh, uh, interests and sensitivities of minor communities, such as, such as uh, transgender people and so on. This is not something that the rest of the world does and look, how much uh, faster they are uh, developing. So I think this is a very strong weapon uh, in the hands of those who criticize liberal democracy today. Um, and if uh, there will be future economic crises that will ex exacerbate the uh, inequality between the West and the rest in the sense that the West is becoming less and less prominent in the world, while uh, countries such as China are, are uh, um, you know, improving further, then uh, it can easily turn into a majority opinion because then you know, those who are uh, criticizing uh, uh, or who are in opposition to the mainstream, they will rightly to some extent point out that there must be something we do wrong if we are so much declining relatively. And, and, and what else can be, uh, that thing that, that we have, have not been doing in the past, let's say in the good old 1950s, because then we were you know, developing and, and, and there was no crime. This is how people remember, or at least some politicians remember, there was no crime, there were no people of different color, there were no uh, same-sex marriages. So let, let's try to go back to those time and then we will be uh, ruling the world again. Thanks very much. Um, Zhuzhana, I'll keep you, uh, if you want to come back on this, uh, if you can hold on to the thought, because we have a couple of questions that I want to throw in, so then if you could respond in the collectively. Um, two questions, in fact, that have come in, so we have a little bit of time and we can at least address them. One of them is on what may appear to be a paradox in the contemporary populism between skepticism about state power, but also wanting to be able to use uh, state power without the liberal limitations that we know on this. Um, would that be an erroneous uh, impression in terms of the understanding of the relationship between populism and state power? And then um, a question, which is a follow-up question from John Vandervert. Uh, you mentioned a different the question of different or smaller publics when you were sharing your slides. So are liberal democrac democracies broken down when society and ideology is stratified or is there a baseline requirement for a collective endorsement of a democratically aligned national identity or national values in order to develop what is the sort of balance uh, between the indiv individuality and collectiveness? 
Uh, big questions, but if you can at least throw some uh, light on this in the in the context of your research project. Um, maybe, Jolt, if you could quickly reply that, and then I'll hand over to Susanna for some responses as well. Uh, I'm happy to do so. So the first question, I think, is important because it highlights what um, we also try to emphasize, that there are different kinds of illiberalism. And uh, <clears throat> there is the, the kind of genuinely populist type. And I think that is genuinely skeptical of uh, the state and of other big uh, corporate uh, organizations. But there are other kinds of illiberalism and, and the uh, paternalistic populist version that uh, I mentioned that is not skeptical of uh, um, uh, the state. So we have to differentiate between the two. It's an interesting point, I guess, to, to, to ask the question whether one can turn into an, the other one. And to some extent, this is what I um, uh, kind of see happening in the United States. That is, uh, uh, there you had a situation where the skepticism against the state, against the government was overwhelming. And now you, you, you have more and more intellectuals and politicians on the, uh, among Republicans who say that actually we can use the state in our favor. So th they are turning from one kind of uh, 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 more populist way of thinking into a kind of more paternalist way of thinking and, and that can uh, have serious uh, political consequences. Um, now, the other question um, just disappeared uh, in, uh, from my uh, screen. Um, I, I see it now. Um, yeah, so I mentioned mini publics. Uh, in our research design, mini publics just means um, a small number of people who are selected either randomly or otherwise, and they will have uh, discussions. We will monitor them and we try to understand better human behavior in that way. But I think your question refers to something that is much debated uh, uh, nowadays. And this is indeed that maybe liberal democracies used to have a kind of integrated public space with an integrated collective identity. And Recently, because of the emphasis on cultural issues, especially on identities, on group identities, this uh, integrated public space became fragmented. And this was seen for a while as a victory of progressives, because some of these small uh, uh, new uh, mini societies were people who were earlier discriminated, and now they had their own public space. So that's great. But indeed, many uh, um, analysts say that actually it worked against liberal democracy. So one solution, according to this logic, is to move back from this identity, group identity focused discourse, trying to think of ourselves as being one large community where everybody is part of the community as an individual, not as a member of a group, and start uh, having some kind of collective vision, which can be social democracy, can be liberal democracy, can be even Christian democratic uh, 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 way of thinking, but um, should be something that unites us. And we should say goodbye to the developments of the uh, 2000, uh, 2010 and, and the 1990s even, when we went too much into this um, niche rhetoric where specific group identities were worshipped. Thank you very much. Um, Zuzana, over to you. We have a few minutes. So uh, why don't you give us your two cents on any or many of these things? Uh, yeah, maybe first uh, on this seeming, uh, I think seeming contradiction between uh, populists um, being skeptical of uh, the state yet uh, having an interest in, in using state power. Um, I think this contradiction is fairly um, 
easy to overcome if we look at the state not just as a, um, an overarching authority, uh, but uh, actually who holds power over the state, who, uh, who is in position. And the skepticism uh, is rather towards um, the, when this criticism comes from opposition, from outside of power, is towards those who hold the power. Uh, but the ultimate goal of uh, such populists or illiberals is to capture that power and shape uh, society um, in, in their image. So in this case, the state itself, uh, its institutions are instruments uh, and the skepticism is not towards having uh, those sort of instruments in place, but towards those who uh, hold the power of them. So uh, in this way, I think this contradiction is just a contradiction on, on the surface. Um, very briefly, I wanted to touch on um, the point about the decline of the West um, and uh, what follows from this. So Joyce laid out what follows from this on the domestic level. So there is uh, an intention to uh, return how things used to be. And uh, there is a turn away from, uh, from liberal values towards uh, more traditional conservative ideas, uh, also a turn away from uh, the individuals, individual rights towards the community, let that be the family or the nation. Um, that's a domestic front. Uh, but the um, decline of the West also has um, international consequences. Um, there is also a trend in turning away from the Western alliances among such illiberal actors, um, seeing them as uh, important and uh, essentially just digging the grave uh, of Western civilization towards uh, rising actors or seemingly rising uh, powerful actors on the international scene. However, uh, apologies if uh, any background noise is being picked up. Uh, my dog wants to go for its walk. Um, so there is a turn towards um, challengers of these Western institutions, um, which happen to be uh, often non-democratic. So through this turn away from uh, European Union, in some cases, in practical terms, also challenging the cooperation between NATO states, as we see recently, is actually in, in a way contributing to uh, that potential decline by, from the inside, undermining these Western alliances that uh, some illiberal actors are part of uh, and are very much in favor of criticizing. Um, so I think we need to look at both of these dimensions uh, because the rise of illiberals in this sense do not only have an impact on the resilience of liberal democracy domestically, but also on the very uh, survival um, of the uh, liberal democratic order internationally. Thank you, Juliana. We're almost on time. I'm going to try and be a bit sneaky and get one last short question to you, Joel, which will require a short answer, which you, you may not be uh, comfortable doing, but I'll try to, to get it out of you, and then we can wrap up. Uh, is to go back to the, the point about the absence or the unlikeliness of the emergence of a unified ideology of autocratization out of these three feeding modules. So as a final question, because I'm curious about it, and maybe that's a launch pad for a future discussion, is does this actually matter? Um, does this, is it something that we should be happy about? Uh, because I can also see that potentially it might be harder to counteract something that is still diffuse among these three modules rather than a clear uh, ideology, fascism or whatever you want to call it. 
So if you have a one minute answer to that one, and then we can use that as the launch pad for a future event, but I'd be curious to hear what you think about this. I think you are right. Uh, actually, if you think back either uh, to the end of the Second World War or to the fall of the Berlin War, it was such a great feeling to see one uh, big uh, monolith uh, collapsing. And this is not something that we will uh, be able to enjoy anymore because they are dispersed, they are everywhere, they are fragmented. Uh, having said that, um, I don't mind uh, that liberal democracy is still uh, the norm across the world, even if this norm is not in, internalized enough, even if this norm is uh, damaged in various ways, questioned and so on, I uh, think that we should still cherish that this model that um, hasn't existed actually 200 years ago and, and was in such a big danger uh, during the Cold War and, 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 and during the Second World War is today a model that um, at least lip service is paid to, and to some extent uh, um, is part of the world order that that uh, Zuzana uh, mentioned. So um, we do have a um, privileged position when we uh, try to defend liberal democracy. We are in a lucky position, but th this work is very hard, partly exactly because uh, the challengers are behind every bush and, and they have their different colors and uh, strategies. And we have to kind of understand them uh, one by one and to think what is the best response to them in a very specific way. Thank you very much. Well, I think that's a good, as good a place as any where we should end up today. Um, I would like to thank both of you, Jolt and Jana, for uh, Fascinating conversation, fascin lots of insights. Um, well, I'm sure our audience will have taken a lot from this. I would recommend that they read the working paper that you have put published, Jolt, and which is on the website, which is linked, uh, put in the chat for you to link to. I would certainly recommend that you follow my colleagues from the Authlib projects uh, on Twitter, on social media, on their website for future events, discussions, publications because I think uh, it's a massive agenda, it's a massive project, it's a massively important project. And over the next three years, it will no doubt be producing very, very interesting discussions to which I look forward to. So thank you to both of you. Thank you to my colleagues at GMF for doing the work behind the scenes, also for making these events possible. And uh, I will say goodbye and until next time. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks Thank a lot, Nick, for the chairman.